Hi, I'm Sean Wildermuth. Welcome back to Coding Shorts. Today's episode, we're going to finally start digging into .NET Aspire. I don't want to use all the templates that they do. I'm going to really just dive into actual code so we can see what it's actually doing for us. This isn't going to be a soup to nuts sort of video. It's going to be getting your toe wet video. And we can talk about some of the use cases for where Aspire can really work. Before we get started, I wanted to do a quick plug for sean.wildermuth.com. It's my website where you can see all the different sorts of things I'm doing, the way I can help your company if you're looking for help, and how you can contact me. Take a look at sean.wildermuth.com. On to the demo. Let's get started. I'll make this example available for you. It's out on GitHub right now. And this is not including anything from Aspire. All we really have, you can see here on the left, is an API project with some minimal APIs. Nothing fancy. We also have a common library, and that's where I'm defining all of the entities and data and context objects and all of that. And then I have a view project out here, a NPM-based project. It doesn't have to be a view, it could be React, it could be Angular, any of those. And really, the idea behind what Aspire is trying to do is really trying to help you figure out how to get all these disparate systems to sort of work together at one. Could be for microservices, it could be for aid in development. There's a few different use cases there. But I want to introduce to you how this actually works. So let's start with the way I would use it normally. Normally, I would go ahead and run my API project, and I'd usually either open my JavaScript or TypeScript project over here in Visual Studio Code and go ahead and execute the dev here. And so I'm working with both tools at once, but essentially I'm going to leave this running so I can make changes. And if I open up a browser, you can see I have a little application that shows a bunch of products for sale. I haven't implemented everything yet, but we can see the simple sort of catalog, right, that we've seen a thousand times. You get a little extra credit if you go down to the comments and explain to me what shoe money tonight means. If you know the reference, let me know. I'll give you some extra points. So this isn't anything special or magical. We just have a couple of projects we want to be able to work together. And so let's stop this. And I'm going to create a new project. I'm in new project and I should be able to look for Aspire here, right? Well, not actually. The reason is I'm still using the current version of Visual Studio. I'm not using the preview. And right now, as of April of 2024, you need to be using the preview. And so let's go ahead and open up our project. And here I'm just going to open a project or solution. And this is just going to be in my projects, shoe money tonight. So just like I would have done before, I'm just going to open up that solution file. The TypeScript project here is already open in Visual Studio Code, so I really don't need to do anything special here. So now that we're in the preview, you can see that up here. Let's go ahead and right click and say Add, New Project. And what I'm looking for is the Aspire app host. This is going to be a project that allows you to run multiple different projects at once to treat them as a distributed application. You also see an Aspire starter application and an Aspire application. These are two creating a brand new project from scratch. But I think a lot of us are going to be starting by adding this to our existing project. And here I'll just call it shoemoney.host to match our project. I'm going to say .NET 8. If I had .NET 9 in here, I could also use that, but 8 is the safer bet right now. And let's look at that program.cs. And we can see, instead of creating a web application, it's creating a builder for a distributed application. So similar idea to the way we use this in our web projects, but a tiny bit different. And what I want to do is I want to add a project. Now, what is a project? I could give it the name or the project path, but usually what you're going to want to do is actually use the add project here in the template. And the way we do that is we get the reference to the API project, and I'm just going to drag it down to host to make a project reference. If you didn't know that that was possible, I probably probably earned all the money you paid for this YouTube video. And this is going to be in a special namespace called Projects, and you'll see API and Host are both there. And then I need to give this a name, the API. And so if I make the host the current project, or the startup project, I'm going to run this thing. Now, this thing is interesting. This is the host project itself. But what you'll notice is this project also has the API being run and has created these endpoints for it. If I click that to open up a new tab and went to API products, it is the API server. It is the correct server for doing that. And these are based on the project settings. 
Now, if we had logs, which we do have in the case of API, but for some of others we wouldn't have, we can look at the log of these disparate pieces. We want to look at some of the details. So this is where the project is. These are the different HTTP and non-HTTP hosts, and then all the secret it's using. This will come into play a little later, but I want you to know that you can see all that stuff here. Now there are traces and structured and metrics. Those are all interesting, but we haven't opted into any of those things yet. We'll do that in a future video. So let's go ahead and stop this project for a minute, and let's think about how we want to add this store project in. I'm first going to come here, and I'm going to kill this running because I'm going to want to let the Aspire host actually run this. So what I want to do is actually say builder add, and you can see different things here that can be added. You can add a container and executable projects, of course, resources. And one of the different ones you can use is add an NPM app, which is what we want to do. Now you may see demos out there where it's using an NPM app here. And the reason it doesn't work is they've broken up a lot of these different kinds of projects into their own assemblies or their own NuGet packages more importantly. So let's go ahead and manage NuGet packages, make sure pre-release is on, and I'm gonna say Aspire node, because node ultimately is what works for our view project. And we're gonna go ahead and get that eight preview, not the nine, because we're using .NET 8 in this particular project. So now that we have that, we we'll see it's yellow now, so it knows what it is, but it does not like what I have in here. So let's give it a name first, and I'll call it the UI. Then we're going to point it at the directory. So in our case, this is going to be up one shoe money dot store, and we're going to give it an npm command. And in our case, we want it to run actually just dev. Now, because this is running the npm app for us, I'm going to specify some things that I want to work. So I'm going to say with endpoint. And in our case, we need to do a few things. We're first going to say target port. And this is the port that it normally runs on, 5173. I'm going to tell it that we're going to be using HTTP as a scheme and that I'm going to communicate the correct port by putting in port there. And this works because in our Vite config, in my particular case, I specified for it to use the environment for port or 5173 if that's the case. So if we run it now, you can see it's running, it's given us a port here, and it's working, but it's not working, right? We refresh this, we'll see that our calls to the API are failing. And they're failing because there is no 8080 port. And there's no 8080 port specifically because that's not where we're running the API. And this is where the magic of Aspire really comes true for me. So let's come in here. I have two projects, and here we're going to say with reference the API. Now, what is that API? That's actually what's returned here. And so I'm telling it, create this project, but make a reference to that API. Let's run and see what's different here. By referring one to the other, if I go ahead and look at the details here, I'm going to see some special environment variables that are passed in, one for HTTP and one for HTTPS. So I'm going to copy this to the keyboard. In fact, if we look at this, we'll see it's just an URL to use as the root. But we need to make that change inside of our view project. And the way we can do that is to just use the port. So I have a special folder in here called Composables, and this is where I'm setting that base URL. This is how all the APIs are being used in view, and this would be the same in other node projects you're using, but I'd like to be able to use environments. And so you would think I would be able to say process.env.host, and more importantly, our complete environment variable that's being passed to us. In fact, I'll just change this to say this and variable, and then just pass it in the API afterwards. And it's going to complain about that, but let's go ahead and rerun this. Let's restart it. Let's go see this. And not only is there no change, I'm actually going to get an error. And it has a problem because process is not defined. Where we would use this process is on things that are actually running directly in Node. And in fact, if we look at our Vite config, we're actually using that here, process port, right, to figure out what that process is. But we have a, essentially an issue here, and that is specific to Vue, because Vue wants to know what these environment variables are when it actually is compiled as well. And that's sort of the problem here, is that you need to have a way of getting these. And Vue has its own. It's called import method. Dot environment. Now I'll tell you right now, that's not going to work either. Because Fuse made a decision that it doesn't want to include every environment variable on a machine to be included in here. We actually have to prefix it. And so the easy way to do that for now, when we actually deploy this, it'll be a little different. Let's create a new file here. And I'm going to call it .env. And of course, it's likely not in the right folder. Nope. 
So we're way down here. And dot m, if you haven't used it before, is just a way you can define environment variables that are local to a machine. So here I'm gonna say vite underscore, which is how these need to be prefixed, apparel. And what am I gonna put there? I'm gonna say dollar sign, the name of my service. And this says, get it from environment variable that's being passed to me. Then I can very simply use the vite prefixed one here. Does that make sense? A lot of moving pieces. We're getting this from Aspire. We're mapping it into something that starts with underscore. And I suspect there's also a way for us to tell Aspire to prefix these as well, but we're not quite there yet. And let's go ahead and restart this yet again. And now it's working. Why is it working? It's working because we're being passed this URL that we can then use inside of our code to tell it where to find this. And this is defining what those are. So we don't need to know what ports those are. See, 5015 for HTTP and 7051 for HTTPS. We just know we're gonna be past it. And that is really the magic here. I only have two projects. Would this be worth it to do it for all these just two projects? Probably not, to be honest with you. But what I think is important here is that you start to see the larger picture because we might be bringing in queues, we might be bringing multiple servers. In my case, I'm probably gonna end up adding a Azure function, which aren't supported until post-release, but an Azure function, but also reading from a message bus or a message such queue, that sort of thing, in order to handle the shipping of these products once they've been ordered. I might also have a, an admin-only interface, probably a separate view app in my case, that I need to also deploy in these ways. And all of these instructions you're putting together are really for Aspire at development time. This is to make it easier for you to handle development time, deployment, and debugging. Now, if you're all C-sharp shop, this gets a lot simpler because these other ones you're going to reference are going to be pretty simple. You might have an API project and a Blazor project and who knows what else. You can also add databases. You can add Redis servers. You can add all sorts of, there's a whole list in the Aspire documentation of currently what are all the pieces. Some it's going to support Azure specific, not cloud specific. Some people are creating one for AWS. So it's an open platform in that way. And ultimately this is going to be, allow you to then generate essentially a script to do deployment, whether that's in Kubernetes or in some other way. So all of this is giving you a bit of a taste for what is actually happening when you create those initial projects. So where does that leave us? Aspire, I think, is a really interesting developer tool for allowing you to create larger, more complex applications that are made up of individual pieces. Does that mean microservices? Not always. Certainly microservices are the obvious thing here, but you also have situations where you have to deploy across a whole different ecosystem in your data center, in the cloud, and you need to have a way to sort of define what all those pieces are. So if you've gotten this far, like and subscribe, you know how the story um, really does help me and I appreciate you watching. We're approaching 15,000 subscribers. I love that, slowly growing over time. Thanks for watching. And we'll be talking about the deployment story in a video coming up, probably in about two weeks. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you want to know about that update. This has been Sean Wildermuth for Wilder Minds. Thanks for joining me.